On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Brian Chi and Mr. Curtis Franklin here today. Now, long gone are the days when organizations controlled all areas of their security. What about third-party software and services? Can you trust them? Well, we'll talk about what organizations can do to ensure their safety. And we talk a lot about edge computing and private networks. Now, what do organizations need to ensure to have connectivity to even the most remote situations? Well, today we have Rajiv Shah, he's CEO of Salona, and he's going to take us through some technology that simplifies wireless connectivity for organizations who normally find it challenging to design. You definitely shouldn't miss it. It's quiet on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. Twit. This is Twit. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 468, recorded November 5th, 2021. Cinco de Cellular. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Worldwide Technology, a platinum IBM business partner. With innovative culture, thousands of IT engineers, application developers, unmatched labs, and integration centers for testing and deploying technology at scale, WWT helps customers bridge the gap between strategy and execution. To learn more about WWT, visit www.com slash twit. And by... Melissa. The U.S. Postal Service processes more than 98,000 address changes daily. Is your customer contact data up to date? Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. And by IT Pro TV. Start your IT career today by getting educated and certified for the big companies looking for IT professionals right now. Visit itpro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code enterprise30 at checkout. Welcome to Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world's connected. I'm your host, Louis Moreska, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. But if I can't guide you by myself, I need to bring in some professionals, the experts in their field, starting with our very own Mr. Curtis Franklin. He's the senior analyst at Amdia, and again, he's the man that has the pulse of the enterprise. Curtis, how are you, my friend? How's the week going for you? Well, it's been a good week so far. I uh, have done a lot of prep for webinars and events to come, uh, doing a bunch of research on things like the training for cybersecurity awareness. So it, it's been a solid week. And my colleagues in the UK and Europe are attending Black Hat Europe right now, another in-person event. I get to watch from uh, quite a bit afar, but uh, things are starting to get back toward normal. And that's good news for pretty much everyone, I think. I agree. I agree. Now, you are, are you that ominous voice behind the scenes of some of these trainings, like the inner world, but you do security training? Well, it's not so much I'm doing the training. I am <laughs> doing a couple, couple of um a couple of webinars, a couple of online events. The uh, On November 17th, as a matter of fact, there is both a webinar on gamification that I'm doing and uh, Dark Reading has a full day virtual event that I'll be participating in. Uh, but mainly looking at other people doing cybersecurity awareness training, trying to figure out what works, what doesn't, and how to tell the difference. Sounds good to me. Welcome back, Curtis. Well, speaking of interesting and capable, he's the very own Mr. Brian Chi. He's an architect of Sky Fiber, and he's the all-around tech guy around here as well. You know, I wanted to question you one thing, uh, Chi, but I heard that you have some green tech going on over there right now. Some green energy. Oh, you bet. Yeah, I I am uh, going into Hawk. Well, I'm burning up my... Uh, capital gains right now from selling the house in Hawaii. And (laughs) to do that, I am putting in a whale of a solar system. It's going to be the new 400 watt Tesla panels. They just hit the market. Um, The brand new super efficient 
end phase microinverters, and then it's going to be feeding a uh, couple of Tesla power walls, some of the new systems. So what's nice is that means I'm going to be able to ride out all these nitpicky little tiny outages that we keep getting in Florida and uh, should be able to go and get my electric bill down to the minimum $12 for Duke Energy. So I'm really looking forward to that. And as all part of that, I'm also segmenting off my home network um, so that I can physically separate my IoT gear from my video, you know, my TV and so forth, and from my professional gear. And that way, if someone does decide they want to sit out in the street and start scanning my network, I'm going to make them really work for it. Fantastic. Well, you're you're definitely going green. I, you know, I wish I could do that here. I think our, our our energy bills are super sky high. Now you get to feed some of that energy back and get a little credit. Yes, indeed. Uh, I do. I will say one thing though: your energy was expensive, but not thirty two cents a kilowatt hour like in Hawaii. No. No. And uh, sadly, Hawaii almost 100 well i call it 99 percent of the power in hawaii is actually bunker oil um so it's the really nasty um almost crude oil it's burned in giant uh crucibles at hawaiian electric now wind power and so forth works but they've had some problems because they didn't in anticipate really hot super salty air and even the original marine grade wind turbines froze solid. Ooh. So lots of fun. So solar has actually been the saving grace in Hawaii. And that's the reason why there's something like 92% penetration of solar into the Hawaii residential market. Wow. Well, one of these days, I'll definitely uh, have to jump on the solar bandwagon for sure thanks Chibert, for being no, there's, here there's no oh, there's no excuse dude you know vermont's been know, on the solar bandwagon for a while <laughs> <laughs> thanks Chibert, making me feel guilty all right guys well we should definitely get started because we've had quite the week in the enterprise lots of information lots of different tech news to go through now long gone are the days when organizations control areas of their own security but because you know what about third-party security their party software, their party services. What, what can you do there? What, can you trust them? What organizations should do there? Well, we'll definitely talk about it. We'll go through some potential options for you. Now, we've talked a lot about the edge and private networks and, and what is the backbone for these networks? Well, in fact, what do organizations do to ensure they have connectivity to their most remote situations? Well, today we have Rajiv Shah, he's CEO of Salona, and he's going to talk take us through some technology that actually simplifies wireless connectivity for organizations who normally find it really challenging to design. So stick around, we have lots to talk about. But first, like we always do, let's head go ahead and jump into this week's Tech Blips. Now, officials, three, two. Now, what's the best way to get organizations to start focusing on something? Well, Nicholas Shalon, the method is to actually quit and call out the government on social media for the lack of focus on cybersecurity. Now, I have a feeling that kickstarted the dominoes falling because just this week, the Justice Department is stepping up to actions to combat ransomware and cybercrime through arrests and other actions. Now, Deputy, Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco calls out a recent scale effort by saying, quote, in the days and weeks to come, you're going to see a lot more arrests, more seizures of ransomware payments to hackers and additional law enforcement operations. Now, if you come for us, we're going to come for you. Monaco said in the interview, I really like this woman. Now, the actions are intended to build off steps taken in recent months, including the recent extradition to the U.S. of a suspected Russian cyber criminal and the seizure in June of $2.3 million of cryptocurrency paid to hackers. Now, Monaco is a longtime fixture in Washington law enforcement, having served as chief of staff at the FBI to then director Robert Mueller and as the head of Justice Department's National Security Division. Now, ransomware attacks have flourished even as the federal government grapples with more old fashioned, albeit sophisticated cyber espionage. Now, the Justice Department has was among the agencies hit hard by that solar winds breach in which Russian government hackers exploited a supply chain vulnerability to gain access to the networks of the federal departments of, and private companies. Now, with the added focus of the Justice Department, Department. It is also sparking organizations in the industry to pledge more in this area. But like every year, 
The year end is when the hackers get into gear during the holidays. So we'll just have to see how serious organizations are in the aftermath. Well, it may be time to check in with your MVSP. A team of tech companies, including Google, Salesforce, Slack, and Okta, recently released the Minimum Viable Secure Product, or MVSP, checklist, a vendor-neutral security baseline listing minimum acceptable security requirements for B2B software and business process outsourcing suppliers. After attacks like those involving SolarWinds and Kaseya, businesses are increasingly aware of how third-party tools and services could serve as a gateway to attackers. This trend has prompted a broader conversation about the IT supply chain and how companies interact with vendors to determine the security of third-party products. Businesses have generally built their own, sometimes arbitrary, list of security measures, creating a headache for vendors that had to then comply with potentially thousands of different requirements. The concept of a minimum security baseline, which evolved to become the MVSP, started with core engineers from Salesforce and Google who saw the opportunity to create a simple set of controls that could be used throughout the vendor onboarding process. Their idea expanded to include input put from other tech firms that brought their advice and lessons learned to the project. Over multiple years, they created a vendor neutral security baseline that establishes minimum acceptable security requirements to make sure core security components are present before moving forward. Now, there's no single way to use the MVSP. Each organization can use it as they see fit and adapt the checklist to their individual needs. That's because the MVSP is an open source security standard maintained by a working group that includes members from those companies like Google, Salesforce, Okta, and Slack that we talked about. And that team hopes to expand the group in the coming months. Members plan to regularly review and update the MVSP's control over time, and they expect that major releases will happen each year following a review process. Future versions of the MVSP will review how the current controls can evolve and aim to bring improvements to system security. The team believes this will help improve industry security over time as organizations start to implement the MVSP within their own processes. Now, Starlink seems to have a nightmare going on. Some people who pre-ordered Starlink broadband say they made tiny changes to their service locations on the Starlink website and immediately had the delivery dates delayed by a year or more. Well, this isn't a case of changing an address from one city to another. People say that using a newly prominent map tool to more accurately pinpoint their house essentially sends a person who pre-ordered to the back of the line. One Reddit user wrote, quote, I moved it from the end of my driveway to my house this morning and just looked back and the availability of date had changed to 2022 to 2023. This person made the change because, quote, it said to check your service address and it didn't tell me it would affect my pre-order. My driveway is a quarter mile long, so it made sense to put the cursor at my house. Well, Quote, I fell victim to the shiny new map on the Starlink website, wrote one person whose delivery date changed from late 2021 to late 2022 or early 2023. Another person wrote that moving the map pin a few feet made the delivery date go from mid to late 2021 to late 2022. Darn. Well, the moral of this story is do not update your service address, especially from Starlink. Now, there are questions out there whether hackers attack and steal data in order to make a media profit. The truth is, most cyber criminals infiltrate your network, lie in wait, and then exfiltrate your data and actually hold on for it for a while. That's right. While they wrestle with the immediate danger posed by hackers today, U.S. government officials are preparing for another long-term threat. Attackers who are collecting sensitive encrypted data now in the hope that they'll be able to unlock it at some point in the future. Now, the threat comes from quantum computers, which will work differently from the classical computers we use today. Instead of the traditional bits made of ones and zeros, they use quantum bits that can represent different values at the same time. Now, the complexity of quantum computers can make them much faster at certain tasks, including 
breaking many of the encryption algorithms currently used to protect sensitive data of today. Now, the threat of a nation state adversary getting a large quantum computer and being able to access your information is real. Now, faced with this harvest now and decrypt later strategy, officials are trying to develop a deploy new and deploy new encryption algorithms to protect secrets against an emerging class of powerful machines. Now, that includes the Department of Homeland Security, which says it's leading a long and difficult transition to what is known as a post-quantum cryptography. Now, experts say if it could still be a decade or more before quantum computers are able to accomplish anything useful. But with money pouring into the field in both China and the U.S., the race is on to make it happen and to design better protections against quantum attacks. Sounds like something out of sci-fi. Now, the U.S. through NIST has been holding a contents contest since 2016 that aims to produce the first quantum computer proof algorithms by 2024. Now, as more organizations begin to consider the looming threat, a small and energetic industry has sprouted up, which companies already selling products that promise post quantum cryptography. Now, however, organizations are reluctant to shell out money right now to make the transition just yet. Now, what this will do is make it actually harder and more costly later to transition. Now, the question is, does your organization see the writing on the wall? and wants to get ahead of the curve. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, the bites. Before we get to the bites, we do have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Worldwide Technology, a platinum IBM business partner. WOT is at the forefront of innovation, working with clients all over the world to transform their businesses. Now, at the heart of the WOT lies their advanced Technology Center or ATC. It's a really amazing thing. Now, the ATC is a research and testing lab that brings together technologies from leading OEMs. There's more than a half a billion dollars in equipment invested in the lab. Now, the ATC offers hundreds of on-demand schedule labs. Now, their labs and proofs of concepts such as the IBM storage POC represent the newest advances in multi-cloud architecture, security, networking, primary and secondary storage, data analytics, and AI, DevOps, and so much more. WBT's engineers and partners use the ATC to quickly spin up proofs of concept and pilots so customers can confidently select the best solutions. Though this helps cut evaluation time from months to weeks. Now with the ATC, you can test out products and solutions before you go to market. You can access technical articles, expert insights, demonstration videos, white papers, hands-on labs, and other tools that can help you stay up to date with the latest technology. Now, not only is the ATC a physical lab, but WWT has also virtualized it. Now, members of their ATC platform can actually access these amazing resources anywhere in the world, 365 days a year. Now, while exploring the ATC platform, make sure to check out WWT's events and communities for more opportunities to learn about technology trends and hear the latest research and insights from their experts. Whatever your business need, WWT can deliver scalable, tried and tested, tailored solutions. WWT brings strategy and execution together to make a new world happen. To learn more about WWT, the ATC, and gain access to all their free resources, visit WWT.com slash twit and create an account on their ATC platform. That's WWT.com slash twit. And we thank Worldwide Technology for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's now time for the bites. And we have a pretty interesting one to talk about today. Now, long gone are the days when organizations controlled all areas of their security. It's out of control in some cases. Now, the threat landscape has changed so rapidly that even if companies and users do everything perfectly to protect their assets and identity, a third-party breach can compromise their personal and private information. We hear a lot about them in the industry. One of the most important issues for organizations to consider today is third-party risk. Now, the solar winds and Kaseya breaches are just two big examples we talk a lot about and how third-party managed service providers can be leveraged to infiltrate a large sets of companies and all of their assets. Now, a Verizon blog recently post points out that millions of organizations depend on third parties that fail to secure systems and data adequately to pre prevent be breaches. Now, you probably have an organization that maybe builds software, maybe has services, maybe uses services that might use third party dependencies. The question is, do you know 
how secure those third-party systems are. Now, for example, SaaS services can leave an organization's software data unprotected and you won't even know until it's too late. In order to prevent these types of situations, businesses must conduct vendor and third-party due diligence. It's very hard to do. Now, small and large businesses alike must spend time vetting third-party service providers about security practices, compliance frameworks, and security methodologies. Now, organizations must start to create a third-party vendor qualification and risk assessment to help with these efforts. Now, there is a new set of requirements out there for organizations here. Most don't take these things seriously because they don't even know about them. In fact, there are situations where they're going to get into trouble in the, in the near future because of this. Now, I want to bring my co-host in here because there are ways to actually reduce this threat, although these ways might actually be quite costly. I want to start with the first one, and I want to throw this to you, Curtis. Auditing third parties for being number one here. How easy is this, is this to do for, for organizations, both on services and software side? Well, there are now a number of services, uh, both consulting services and packaged uh, services that do that third party auditing. So this is a, a known issue. And there are quite a few companies that will help your organization solve the problem. The, the issue that they will tell you, though, is that third party isn't the real problem. It's when you get down to fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh party <laughs> vulnerabilities that you really have have trouble. And one of the things that I'm going to be addressing in my research for 2022 is the question of realistically, how many levels of dependency do you need to audit in order to say that you've done your due diligence? Um, can you audit your third party dependencies and trust that they have done the same and that every party in the chain has been diligent? Or do you have to assume that no one has been diligent and therefore you must audit everyone? Because if you have to go more than one or two layers deep, then the cost and complexity starts to skyrocket. This is especially true when it comes to software dependency. You, Lou, certainly know that it is rare today to have a major software project that doesn't use at least some open source library function uh, module API something. And the question is, which dependencies do they have? How far do you need to go? Um, again, there are there are services out there that take this on and say, we will audit down to N levels. But it's a very real issue for virtually every organization out there that's doing any sort of significant software development or significant hosting of applications on cloud service providers. Yeah, I think this is an interesting topic because you're right. I think a lot of organizations don't really understand how deep the rabbit hole goes when it comes to dependency trees. And I think you're right. It could be that you know, you're depending on, you know, even in the web community today, you know, you might there, there, there might be a, a library that depends on, it's very rare that you have a true function type library, which is one that depends on nothing else but itself, other than just pure JavaScript functions uh, that are part of the JavaScript runtime. The same thing goes for a lot, even in the native world. You know, you see a lot of organizations out there building software, you know, Adobe, so on, that are using, uh, you know, third party libraries that are developed by other other companies, again, these third-party libraries might, again, use open source technology within them. So I think there's a lot going on there. Uh, but, you know, I think for sure that there needs to be more uses of services and auditing to help with this. But it's going to be challenging because a lot of it's, you know, hidden. It's uh, it's black box. Curtis? Yeah, and I just want to give a good, you know, realistic example of this. You know, everyone... Uh, we used it, you know, solar winds was has been the the gift that keeps on giving if you're a journalist or an analyst. Um, because you know, their reach was so broad and the impact was so great. And people said, How could solar winds have have done this to us? Well, it wasn't solar winds code, it was a vulnerability 
in a third party, actually a couple of layers down for them. Um, and this is just a very real case. So, you know, if you had done your due diligence and checked on solar winds, they would have, you know, you would have checked out okay. And then I'm going to believe that, you know, people like the DOD actually did that. Um, but go a couple layers down, there was a vulnerability, it was exploited. And so we have a huge story. These are very real cases and they're not going away anytime soon because no one, there is not a company out there that has any kind of real application need that has the desire or the budget to start writing every line of code from scratch. I agree. I agree. Well, there are some companies out there that already write their lines of code from scratch and it's painful sometimes. So that's why they use third party libraries. So I'm totally with you there. Um, now, Cheaper, I want to throw this to you because, you know, services are another whole ball of wax because these are, again, even bigger black boxes. And so how do you trust these services when it comes to, you know, ensuring that, you know, you, you know, you can, uh, you know, from security to, to privacy? You know, Kurt and I wrote a book together a while back called The Technologies and Strategies of the Ubiquitous Data Center. And we actually spent almost an entire chapter on how to deal with service level agreements. And one of the quotes that we had was from the gentleman that is an at-large member of the ICANN um, Board of Directors. And he was also previously the chairman of the board for the California Bar Association. His name is Carl Auerbach. Carl had some really interesting views that we did a very large quote from. Um, but the conversation we had with Carl and some other folks um, with an opposing um, uh, um, opinion was that service level agreements are not necessarily the do all end all. You could write and spend the money for the most aggressive service level agreement on earth. And your provider then says, well, darn, we're in breach. We're going to close up shop and do bankruptcy. So there's a balance that you have to do. And it's, um, it's a tough one. So, yeah, we can do service level agreements. I think it's more along the lines of open the conversation with your providers. You know, don't just blindly say, yes, I agree. Have a conversation with the sales group. Uh, you, if you have a decent amount on the line, push them a little hard enough to go and get the corporate lawyers involved so that you guys can take a good hard look at the service level agreement and find out if it's even reasonable for you. Um, when I was doing a lot of work for the federal government, this was actually one of my favorite things. Sit down, meet, say, what does this really mean? What, what if I started, I was very good at doing what if scenarios, what if you have a breach, <laughs> what if someone got into your data centers, what if this, what if that start asking the hard questions. That's really what you need to do. You need to ask the hard questions. What happens to your data if the provider um, goes bankrupt? What happens to your data if there's a breach? Is the entire data center locked down by the authorities? Like what happened to a company? You know, they, they lost their entire server farm at their ISP because of a hacker or a someone doing some malfeasance on their servers that just happened to be next to them. Um, you need to go and ask, go and get, you know, maybe just get the most paranoid person on your staff to go and sit down and look at that service level agreement because it might be worth just saying, okay, instead of going completely cloud, let's do a hybrid approach just so I can keep some of my, you know, a copy of my data on premise and we'll see, you know, you know, is, is it something we can do? Are the compliance issues even reasonable? You know, especially if you start getting into things like object storage services. And you know what? I think I'm going to toss OSS um, towards Kurt because he's had a lot more direct 
um, contact with people that do OSS. And I just see it from a kind of a theoretical point of view. Well, I mean, OSS, like I said, it is um, a legitimate and almost inevitable part of every, call it every significant software development effort. Uh, we've come so far since the days when open source software was stuff that hobbyists used or people used in academia. I mean, this is a very real part of very real enterprise software at kind of every level. Uh, in many cases, the software that they are developing is as robust and as well developed, as secure as anything that comes from a commercial provider. But there are exceptions. And the problems really come when those exceptions lie in tiny, almost, you know, minuscule functions right. that are grabbed and plugged in uh, that simply are not vetted as well as some others. Now, you know, again, there are services out there that go and look at all of these dependencies, will track down every dependency through the tree for your organization. They charge, in some cases, uh, quite a lot of money for that. Could be well worth it if it saves your critical data. For others, you know, there are rules of thumb. Try to use open source software that comes from well-populated, well-established, multi-person uh, maintainer projects. Uh, right. If you've got something that has a single maintainer who last updated, you know, four months ago, uh, maybe you take a second and much harder look at that code. Um, but it's all part of software development in the 21st century. I agree. I think what, there's one big challenge, especially with open source, is the fact that some of these services we talk about here, they might just scan your software and build a dependency tree for you and then only alert you to the things that are already known. So, for instance, if there's a vulnerability in a DLL or a library that you're using that's already a known vulnerability and you're on a particular version of that file, they'll say, hey, you're depending on this file. It's got a vulnerability. Go find the update. Right. The problem here is if there's vulnerabilities they don't know about. Uh, and so there are other services that attempt to use semantic analysis of the code if it's open source or even scanning the library for, for APIs or other things that might be, uh, you know, uh, able to be exploited. But again, those are the harder ones. And I think those are the ones that you're not going to know because it's obfuscated away from you or it's compiled away from you. And so you're not going to actually know until it's too late. Uh, and so it, it's a very challenging thing uh, for any organization. I want to ask one more question before we move on, because we definitely have a, we have a really interesting guest who want to get to it. But I think one question is really around compliance. So Cheever talked about SLA and ensuring security and privacy. But what about compliance? Is it part of that SLA? Do, do, do you need to go? How do you enforce this across all the stacks, Curtis? Well, I think that you do have to put uh, compliance into your SLAs. Uh, therefore, if for some reason you have a dependency that's down the tree, you have an agreement with your direct providers that says that they should have vetted this. You have some recourse. Um, you know, as far as compli regulatory compliance, boy, howdy, does that depend on a bunch of things? Um, and, you know, which industry you're in, where you're located, where the business unit that is using the software is located. And, oh, by the way, where their clients are located, therefore, where must their data be stored? Um, I have nothing but sympathy for uh, pretty much any CIO of a multinational corporation these days because it is just a, a mess trying to keep up with all of the regulations. The fact is, though, that there are certain regulations that do require you to stay on top of these things. Uh, PCI uh, certainly does. Uh, anytime you're dealing with PII, personally uh, identifiable information, 
you're going to have to deal with it. And that's regardless of whether you're in the European Union or in the U.S. And if you're in the U.S., whether you're in California or not, because you almost certainly have customers who are in those jurisdictions, even if that's not where your headquarters are. So, yeah, there there are lots and lots and lots of, of regulations. They should be in your SLAs, but never forget no, that regardless of what the SLA says, if there is a breach, if there is someone who takes advantage of a vulnerability, the responsibility ultimately is yours. Um, you can turn around and sue somebody else, but that's going to be after the regulators come to you and point out that you have a problem. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. Next up, the guests. But before we get to the guests, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in enterprise tech, and that's Melissa. Now, having accurate customer address data is crucial for the success of your business. Now, did you know that nearly 36 million address changes were processed by the USPS in 2020? I was one of them. Now, that's a huge chunk of customers you could be missing out on. 30% of customer data goes bad each and every year, but Melissa can help make sure your data is current and accurate. Now, Melissa's tools have helped businesses maintain fresh data for over 35 years, which explains why over 10,000 businesses trust the address experts. Now, Melissa has a renewal rate of over 92%. And why is that? Well, because 25% is a typical return on investment realized by Melissa customers. Now, you can verify addresses, emails, phone numbers, and names in real time with Melissa. Now, Melissa's global address verification service verifies addresses for over 240 countries and territories at the point of entry. Now, tired of having duplicate customer information in your databases? Well, with Melissa's data matching, you can eliminate clutter and duplicates, increase your accuracy of the database, and reduce postage and mailing costs. Now, get the information that completes your customer profiles better. Add consumer demographic info to your records, such as marital status or social media handles. And Melissa's flexible deployment options offer different platforms to suit any preference, business size, or budget. Now, with flexible on-premise, web service, secure FTP processing, and software as a service delivery options, Melissa also has their new lookups app on iOS and Google to search addresses, names, and more just at your fingertips. Melissa also continuously undergoes independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance requirements. In fact, their SOC 2 HIPAA, and GDPR compliant. Now, Melissa's Global Support Center also offers 24-7 world-renowned support if you sign up for service level agreement. Inquire today. Now, Melissa is still supporting communities and qualifying essential workers during COVID-19. See if your organization qualifies for six months of free service by applying online at Melissa. Dot com. Now, in G2 Crowd's 2021 grid report, Melissa scored 89% for ease of use, 91% in quality of support, and 96% in ease of doing business with, as well as 93% meets requirements. So you can see their commitment to providing a best data quality and address verification software around. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records clean for free at melissa.com slash twit. That's melissa.com slash twit. And we thank Melissa for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twyat Riot. And today we have Rajiv Shah. He's the CEO of Solona. Welcome to the show, Rajiv. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Now, our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you take us through a short journey to short journey through tech and what brought you to Solona? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, firstly, thank you so much for the time and. Uh, yeah. My journey is um, like a bunch of people in the 90s who came from India, which is where I was born. And, you know, 90s was a fun time in India because we just got exposed to the PCs. Uh, I first ever saw a computer in high school, never seen a computer till then. 
But we had been hearing about it in the news and TV, the computer revolution is coming, there were big debates. Is the computer going to take human labor completely out? And there's this glamour associated with it. So the first time I saw it, I thought I was seeing some magical box. Um, <laughs> and I was already very positively biased towards being in the tech. And uh, long way of saying, you know, the journey continued, continued my love for software. I was a software developer for most of my early career and eventually found my way to developing software for communications, eventually wireless communications. And over the last two decades, um, as I say often, it seems like wireless runs in my blood now. That sounds like the most interesting thing, as geeky as it sounds to me. <laughs> It's very interesting. It's that's a great story, Ajeev. Now, I talk to a lot of organizations out there, especially ones who are doing, you know, warehouse management, manufacturing plants, and they're always, always, always concerned about availability and redundancy and connectivity. So it's a really super interesting space. Salona is doing something pretty interesting here. Can you maybe take us through what you guys are doing in this space? Yeah, I think you know one of the fascinating things that I find about tech in general is. Um, over the last 20 years, especially, you know, if you picked a person from the street and said, hey, what's the greatest thing you've seen? They might point to an app on their phone. And uh, I think most of us here know behind that is a whole bunch of infrastructure. One of which that I find the most fascinating is the wireless communications piece. It sits at this underpinning of how we experience life so differently, do work so differently. And so to your point, places like warehouses, people like in manufacturing plants. Um, one of the surprising things that we have seen is they're nowhere near as connected as we are sitting in these tech offices. And the reason for that is they're usually situated in relatively remote locations, not in the middle of the business district. Inside those environments are not as simple as these office environments. There is a lot of metal, they are huge spaces, they have a lot of changes all around. These are tough things to connect using wireless. And what that implies is when there isn't wireless communication, then you can't do what's become the favorite buzzword, which is digitize. And so much of the workflows in those environments has not gotten to the level of digitization that we expect as a result of that. So long way of saying wireless communications, in my opinion, is that nervous system that's needed for most of these businesses. And uh, we have identified a portion of that that we think deserves an attention that we call 5G LAN. Um, and the way I think of it is, think of connectivity to the location. That's the WAN or the broadband. That's not what we play in. But then once you have internet connection to the facility, you still need to spread it as efficiently and high quality across that facility. And we think cellular and 5G can do a phenomenal job at that as well. And that's the part we at Salona focused on. So this is interesting. We hear a lot, a lot about the concept of private networking, private mobile networking. Um, and, and it seems like um, it's a challenging thing to adopt because I think a lot of organizations, like you said, they have technology that might be at the edge that like, well, let's say security systems or um, you know, temperature systems, whatever, IoT devices. And these things need consistent connectivity um, and they're hard, hard places to get connectivity at. Uh, how, how easy is it for an organization to go in and say, okay, you know what? I want to move to a Salona solution to help manage this. What, what do they have to do to get started? What's, what's kind of the progression here? Yeah, our goal really was uh, we wanted to make cellular systems as accessible to the enterprise IT audience as Wi-Fi has become over the last two decades. And so that's what we have achieved over the last two years that we have been building this. And so if you are an IT professional that runs or has built enterprise Wi-Fi networks, then this should be very familiar, right? I mean, the product of whatever solution as you might describe it, looks like a set of radios, very similar to what your Wi-Fi access points look like, that would work with your existing uh, LAN or the network that you already have and give you that wireless connectivity at the edge for those applications you mentioned. One of the beauties of what cellular can do that really has never been done 
is for the first time, you can actually get guaranteed quality of service over the air. And, you know, I jokingly say I built a lot of my career in Wi-Fi. I was at uh, Aruba for a very long time. And for the last few years, I think I described my experience as a set of nervous incidents one after the other. Every time you feel that pang at the back of your head, man, really, they're going to put that on the Wi-Fi network. I don't know if that's going to run well. Those are the things that cellular can solve, right? Whether you think of real-time video, whether you think of this very mission-critical sensor or some motor that really needs a command from somewhere that you can't lose packets on. Every one of those things that we have said, man, too reliable, too critical to run on Wi-Fi, let's put a cable there. That's what we at uh, Solana want to replace and do it with 5G. Yeah, there are, there are a lot of organizations that find it very difficult to, you know, some organizations find it very difficult to place down cables in some cases. Uh, and so, of course, wireless and in this case, 5G is a much better solution because obviously it costs less. It's a less adoption rate. What, what, what kind of market sectors are you seeing this adopt more? I think the top three sectors we are seeing is uh, logistics. And when I say logistics, I truly mean the whole supply chain, right? All the way from the transportation yards to the shipyards and the rail yards, going into the warehouses. Oftentimes, retail stores have just become large distribution centers, especially in the world of COVID, where their primary job was to distribute this to the customers buying online. So that entire supply chain has been going through such a wave of automation and digitization that they have really been early adopters of this technology. The second, I think, has been manufacturing uh, of every type. And I think they have realized how much they need to modernize to keep up with uh, somewhat also the geopolitical environment, right? If you want to try to bring back manufacturing into the US and the Western uh, democracies, to an extent, you can't do it the way we did it 30 years back. You have to view it to your strengths. You have to automate, you have to create more robotics. And those are all things that need a highly predictable wireless network. So huge demand from manufacturing. Um, another thing, interestingly, highly accelerated by COVID, because we think of COVID and not being able to go to workplace as a flexibility thing. To the manufacturing, it was if the person cannot come in to do their work, I need that expert to have access to those machines, to those uh, motors, to those engines remotely. So I need the ability to have things like augmented reality and computer vision guiding these things even faster. So if anything, you know, that's another sector that COVID actually accelerated automation and digitization and in turn demand for us. Um, the third that we have seen a lot of interest from has been uh, large areas like cities and campuses, uh, again, driven by, you know, what you're hearing in the popular news a lot, which is how do you modernize infrastructure? One of the key elements of modernizing infrastructure is to make it connected so it can actually be monitored, controlled, managed more and more remotely with more automated systems. So all things that are, you know, that are, we're moving at a pace have gotten a super boost in the world of COVID have really been the places where we are seeing it, right? Logistics, manufacturing, cities, even smart agriculture, uh, precision farming in that area. So those are the verticals that we are seeing a lot of interest in. Fantastic. Lots of interesting stuff there. We do have a lot more to talk about. But before we do, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech, and that is IT Pro TV. Whether you're a seasoned IT professional or someone looking to break into the world of IT, IT Pro TV is the community you need. Tim Broom and Don Puzzett created IT Pro TV because it was the training they wanted for themselves. Now with IT Pro TV, you can advance your career in a fun and creative way. They have seven studios and are filming every day, Monday through Friday with their enthusiastic 
edutainers. Now they have the most up-to-date content with every vendor and skill that you need to advance your IT career. Now their courses go from the studio to their course library in 24 hours and are divided into 20 to 30 minute episodes. Pretty easy to watch. Now, if you're looking for something specific, their transcripts are also searchable. Now, the month of November is AWS month at IT Pro TV. November 13th and 14th, they have a free weekend. Now, three free AWS courses available to free members, new AWS videos on the IT Pro TV YouTube channel, AWS guests on the IT Pro TV podcast as well. Now, on November 18th, at 2 p.m., they have a webinar on Cloud Data Protect on AWS featuring Tracy Pierce, Senior Security Consultant for AWS. Start your IT career today by getting educated and certified for the big companies looking for the IT professionals now. Visit itpro.tv slash enterprise for an additional 30% off all consumer subscriptions for the lifetime of your active subscription when you use code ENTERPRISE30 at checkout. Now that's itpro.tv slash enterprise and use code enterprise30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. And we thank IT Pro TV for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, we've been talking with Rajiv Shah. He's the CEO of Salona. We've been talking a lot about modernizing infrastructure. I want to bring my co-host back in because there is still lots to talk about here. I want to throw it to uh, Chibert first. Chibert? Well, I think one of the things we probably ought to do now <clears throat> is Solana provided us with a short video clip and it goes and explains part of the provisioning process and some of the technology behind it. And I think that'll lay a really good foundation for continuing the conversation. So why don't we play that now, and then we'll come back and do a roundtable. You know, demo today, the goal is to onboard a new user from the exec team who is highly mobile, a heavy user of the MS Teams conferencing platform. We will connect their BYOD iPhone and iPad to the Salona platform using eSIM, assign them to the exec team device group, and then create an application policy that prioritizes their MS Teams calls. Now, this diagram shows the network architecture of the Salona platform, which is overlaid on your existing network, just like an enterprise Wi-Fi deployment. Configuration is managed via the Salona orchestrator. So let's get started. I'm already logged in, so we'll go to the devices section and we'll quickly look up the executive user and you can see we have two eSIMs assigned to that user, one for their iPhone, one for their iPad Pro. They're provisioned, but they have not yet been activated. So we'll activate the eSIMs assigned to this user. At the same time, we can assign them to the executive group. I've already added the eSIM to the iPhone. Let's go ahead and do the same for the iPad. eSIM technology is a game changer for BYOD and secure onboarding in the enterprise. No more certificate management or shared passwords to access the network over wireless and no physical SIM assets to manage. We've already activated the eSIM so the iPad should automatically connect to the Salona private mobile network. You can see that's connecting. We can view the devices pages now and hopefully see that our iPhone and iPad are connected. With that completed, we can now create our MS Teams policy. First, we define our application. Our MS Teams uses ports 3478 to 34. 81 for real-time media. So that's what we specify in the server start and end port of our application. Now our application is defined, we can move on to creating the microslicing policy, which will protect any MS Teams calls for devices in the exec team group. Go MS Teams. We use non-guaranteed bitrate because Teams uses a variable bitrate for voice and video. 
highest priority signaling across the network because this is voice and video, it's two way. We want that to go first at all times. Four devices in the executive team device group when they're using the MS Teams application. We click save and that's it. Our network is now configured to provide a guaranteed MS Teams experience for our exec team members, iPhone and iPad. So really cool, but those are really modern devices. The newer iPhones, newer iPads all support eSIMs and they support multiple SIMs, at least two. In fact, I think the new um, iPhone 12 that I have, I think it can have like three or four. Now, so my question for Rajiv is, can it support the older LTE or three, even the older 3G devices um, like the barcode scanner um, guns that are used in a lot of warehouses? Um, can it support the older IoT devices like alarm systems, temperature monitoring, humidity monitoring, and things like that? Yeah, great question, uh, Brian. So the technology that we are introducing does not automatically get supported by the older devices. So most of the newer devices, as you mentioned, post 2019, 20, everything that comes with a cellular connection does support it. But if it is prior to that, then it probably does not support it automatically. So the specific feature you want to look for as you're asking your device partners is support for private cellular or CBRS as it is commonly known. And that's a pretty common thing in anything that supports cellular post 2019, as I said. Now what's happening in a lot of these uh, environments like the logistics and manufacturing that I described is there is um, slowly but steadily a move away from dedicated devices to really using some of the mobile operating systems, whether it's Android or uh, even iOS in some cases, to be the general purpose compute for device and then use that both inside and outside. So as an example, one of our customers is starting to hand out this new Samsung ruggedized phones to all their staff members in the stores and distribution centers. And they can use that for all functions from barcode scanning to voice internal and external and actually carry it home. And when it goes out, they actually continue using the external macro network as well, using the dual SIM capability that Brian, you just described. So we are seeing this transition, whether it's in hospitals or stores or warehouses, to really converging on these more modern devices. Uh, obviously, that's a transition that takes its own period, um, but that's a, certainly a trend we are watching. In the cases of hospitals, they are really... Uh, also able to get a better experience to say nurses instead of going with like a pager and another push to talk device and another phone and five devices like that, they can move to a single iPhone as an example and have all of those as applications on it. So um, that's kind of what we are seeing and that's hand in hand with the adoption of the new networking technology that we are bringing in. You know, private cellular wasn't easy before. It was really hard. I actually designed a system for NATO, uh, specifically using the old 2G GSM stuff so that I could group NATO troops by languages so we could use what was then new uh, text messaging, SMS text messaging, in the correct language. Um, the granularity that you're starting to describe, it sounds like this is well, not quite plug and play, but it sounds like a CBRS system doesn't require a lot of licensing. You know, does Salona handle the licensing if there is any? And just how plug and play can this be? So great question, you know, Brian, one of the reasons why Salona even exists or the market exists is FCC did something really innovative about four to five years back is when it started and got officially approved two years back in the CBRS spectrum band. So as many viewers might know, traditionally cellular spectrum has been auctioned off and it's cost quite a lot and runs in billions of dollars, if not tens of billions of dollars, and therefore can only be afforded by you know, the mobile network operators. 
What FCC did with the CVRS spectrum is they created what they call a shared spectrum model. And they created some software entities, you know, cloud-based software entities, who would essentially dynamically handle spectrum allocation to each radio as and when they came up. The net effect of that from an enterprise perspective is you can now deploy radios in the spectrum band as plug and play as you do Wi-Fi. And all of that spectrum allocation and granting is happening behind the scenes through a simple software API call. Now that you have crossed that, as an enterprise, you now have the ability to build your own cellular network for the first time. Right? And that's so revolutionary. That was a very critical piece of the puzzle that closed in 2019, 2020. The second part of this is still that happened. Obviously, you couldn't do it. And so there were no products that catered to their enterprise IT audience. So Salona as a company existed because we saw the opportunity to say, now that the spectrum's available, you can create an entire product suite just for the enterprise audience. And so now we have come out with it. There will be, and there are other people trying to do the same thing. And I think that's now the opportunity for the enterprise IT teams to say we can build our own. Now, one uh, comment I will make for the global audiences, CBRS is a US concept. Um, that was 150 megahertz of spectrum that FCC opened up. But behind that now, Practically every country is looking at their own version of CBRS. So UK has more spectrum, Germany now has spectrum, Netherlands has spectrum, Japan has opened up a lot of spectrum. Practically every country around the world is trying to figure out their model for allowing enterprises to build their own cellular network. And that's what's uh, really exciting. And one historical view to look at is the last time the broad enterprise market got access to spectrum and a full ecosystem was the Wi-Fi industry in the late 90s. That led to the entire mobile enterprise revolution. We are at the cusp of the next of that revolution. It's now that there is private spectrum and private cellular ecosystem available, we are confident it will drive the automation and digitization wave in these industries. Oh, Rajiv, I'd like to, to talk about going to market because we've been talking about organizations building their own 5G network, but realistically, do you find that most of your customers are doing this for themselves or is the typical way that a custom, customer sees your network bound into an, an application and service offering that's coming to them wholly put together by a third party? That's a great question. Uh, we see a little bit of both. So we absolutely see some of the larger enterprises that see the potential of the private 5G platform to run many applications, and so therefore are running it themselves. On the other hand, we are seeing a wave of new purpose-built devices and applications, especially in the robotic space where they find that the network connectivity in their customer premises is so important to their service level that they want to control it. And so they include our uh, piece in their overall solution and provide it to the end enterprise customer. So we're certainly seeing a little bit of both. Now, how this shapes up in the long term is honestly an uh, open question. Does it really end up being bold or does this eventually turn into where every enterprise IT team runs their own network and does not take it from the solution provider TBD? The third thing I'll say is, you know, there is an increasing role um, of a service provider, but not in the more traditional sense. Uh, I think what CIOs are looking for is help and expert competence in running these networks because they don't want to be the experts always in wireless, but at the same time, not giving up control, especially over things like security, privacy, the ability to roll out new services and so on. So there is a genuine opportunity for the what I call the modern service provider that is able to give that core competency while still providing the enterprise all the control and uh, visibility that they are looking for. 
Well, now, you mentioned a word in your response that I, w- I want to pick at just a little bit, uh, security. You will find people who would claim that 5G is an inherently secure technology. I don't believe in inherently secure technologies. Um, if it's inherently secure, that just means that um, really good hackers haven't spent time with it yet. So my question to you is, how do you see deploying your 5G network complicating the security scenario for an organization? Do you find that it adds yet another attack plane and attack vector? Or are most of your customers using it to replace one or more other uh, layer one technologies so that they're reducing their overall exposure? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, one that every CIO and CISO is asking us. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's nothing inherently secure about any technology, right? Every technology is eventually got some elements that we just don't know. Private 5G has one thing, which is, I think it raises the bar. I always think of it as what's your minimum bar of security? And what 5G does for the enterprises, it gives them a wireless technology where the minimum bar is higher than the minimum bar of their current wireless technologies. And specifically, what does that mean? Your minimum way to connect into a 5G network is to use SM, whether ESM or physical, and it has dynamic encryption, everything is encrypted, and you have to support all of the security that comes in associated with that. Um, unlike potentially something like Wi-Fi that does not disallow the use of an open network or disallow the use of a shared key for some level of security, which unfortunately, especially when you things like IoT, you find a prevalence of those type of security methods today on the wireless network. So I think it raises the minimum bar of security. And we are seeing a strong um, demand for these networks just for that reason. Because they're saying, okay, even if our customers or users inadvertently cannot set the network up that way. Now that having been said, one of my core beliefs is if you treat this new private 5G thing as a shadow network on the side, then you have opened up another vector of attack like you described. The right way to think about the architecture here is to think of it as a part of your network enterprise architecture, yet another access technology. It comes with its own tools and mechanisms, but make it as closely integrated to your existing network and security systems. Right? Tangibly, what that means is one of the things often some of the legacy architectures do is they make everything coming out of 5G networks come through a NAT IP address. Suddenly all your firewall policies are broken, all your user groups are broken, your segmentation is broken. That would be the kind of stuff that would create, I think, more headaches than it's worth it. Uh, Our opinion is you've got to find a way to translate this technology to existing systems because enterprise security is going to keep evolving as you've spoken a lot in this podcast. Um, and we've got to keep this as an integral part. If we do that, then I think the combination of raising the minimum bar and providing a good integrated solution, we may become a net positive for security in wireless networks. Uh, that's that's the architecture I think that leads us in the right direction. Fantastic. Thank you, Rajiv. Well, unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Rajiv, thank you so much for being here. We're running a little low on time, but I did want to give you a chance to tell the folks at home where they can learn more, how their organizations can get started on Salona. Yeah, nothing like the website, salona.io. And uh, if there's one thing I would say that if you are not thinking about 5G to help you automate and industrialize and digitalize faster, you should. And when you do, uh, I hope you come to Salona.io. It has a bunch of resources. Reach us through our social media or any of the channels. We're looking forward to talking to most of you. Thanks again. Well, folks, you've done it again. You sat through another hour of the best thing, Enterprise Podcast in the universe. Definitely keep 
turn your podcatcher to Twyat. I do want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to my world-class co-host, starring with our very own Mr. Brian Chi Chibert. What's going on for you in the coming weeks and where can people find you? I think I'm going to be dropping an email to Rajiv and seeing if I can sign up as a Salona dealer for my company in Honolulu. That sounds awesome. But anyway, I'm going to be getting ready for Maker Fair Orlando. So I'm going to be going a little crazy. I'm also getting a new solar system put onto my house. But, you know, I am ADV NET LAB, Advanced Net Lab on Twitter. And I would love to hear your show ideas. Yeah, there's there's a picture of my uh, new roof going on. I, I uh, spent the money for a 100-year a roof for ants trying to get a good picture of that. Anyway, I am also Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T at twit.tv. And if you want to send email to all the hosts, you can use twiat at twit.tv. We'd love to hear your show ideas and... You know, life is good. And, you know, we're we're still taking, nom- I think we're taking nominations for best of for 2021. And uh, going to be all kinds of fun and games. So love to hear from you and love your show ideas. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thank you, Chibert. Well, we also have to thank our very own Mr. Curtis Frank. And Curtis is very busy flying around town. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming weeks? And where can people find all of your work? Well, I'm preparing for three different uh, online events. I'm preparing some research, uh, getting ready to write a couple of articles. So everyone, follow me over on Twitter. I'm at KG4GWA. Uh, My stuff is going to be there. And I would love to have you be in the audience for uh, some of my stuff. Ask me questions. Uh, would like to have some of that quiet riot energy uh, when I'm talking enterprise security management. Thank you, Curtis. Looking forward to that. Well, folks, we also have to thank you as well. You're the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. We want to make it easy for you to watch and catch up on your enterprise news. So go to our show page right now twit.tv slash twiat. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, the co-host information, the guest information, and the links for the stories that we do during the show. But more importantly, next to those videos, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support our show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice. Listen on any one of your devices, on any one of your podcasts or applications, because we're on all of them. So definitely subscribe and support the show because we can't do this show without your support. So definitely subscribe. Plus, you may have also heard, that's right, Club Twit. It's a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can't get anywhere else. And guess what? It's only $7 per month. Now, one of my favorite things about Club Twit is definitely the exclusive access to the members only Discord channel. I got a lot of great characters, some great channels in there, some great topics. Just, just be part of it because it's, it's a really fun. And also, they are GIF masters in there. Definitely. So, definitely check out the, 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 the Twit channels in there and be part of the movement. Go check it out right now at twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, remember, Club Twit now offers corporate group plans as well. It's a great way to give your team access to ad-free tech podcasts. And the plans start with five members at a discounted rate of $6 each per month. And you can add as many seats as you'd like. And it's a really great way for your IT departments, your developers, your tech teams to stay up to date with all access to all of our podcasts. It's just like regular membership. They can join that Twit Discord server and also get the Twit Plus feed as well. So definitely have them join twit.tv slash Club Twit. Now, after you subscribe, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twy because we talk a lot about some fun tech topics on the show. And I can guarantee they will find it interesting and fun as well. So definitely share it with them and have them subscribe as well. Now, if you've already subscribed and you're available on Fridays, 1.30 p.m. Pacific time, we do the show live. That's right. We do it live. We mess up. We do all the fun stuff, all the behind the scenes. Come see how the pizza is made. Check it out at live dot twit dot tv no i mess up the guys don't uh and come see how the show is run come to see the behind the scenes come see the banter that we have plus if you're going to watch the show live definitely jump into the chat room live as well. You have that famous IRC chat room it, you can go to just irc dot twit dot tv sign in there with a screen name and you can be part of the discussion as well we have some great characters in there some amazing 
tech topics. A lot of great questions come from there. So definitely check out IRC twit.tv. Now definitely hop over to Twitter right now and go to Lou MM because there I post all my enterprise tidbits. You can DM me for show ideas. We can talk about the industry. I, I post all my ramblings around enterprise news there. And of course, you can also check out what I do dur- normally during my work week as well as Microsoft. And you can also go check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. You may have heard some pretty amazing things coming out of there. Uh, Ignite was this past week. And so a lot of some really awesome things came out of that. So definitely check it out. Loop, Office Scripts, you name it, check it out there. So developers.microsoft.com slash office. I want to thank everyone who makes the show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support these sweet enterprise tech each and every week and we couldn't do the show without them. So thank you for their support over the years. I also want to thank all the engineers and staff at Twit. Of course, I want to also thank Mr. Brian Chi one more time because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer as well. He does all the show bookings and the plannings for the show and we really couldn't do the show without him. So Chibert, thank you for all your support over the years. And before we sign out, we have to thank our editor for today, Mr. Victor, and of course, our TD for today, the talented Mr. Ant Pruitt. He does a fabulous show called Hands-On Photography. Ant, uh, what's coming up this week on Hands-On Photography? Well, for the folks looking at the screen, there's an image up there, but that's not just any image. That is what's called an NFT, non-fungible tokens. That's one that I created. So the topic for this week's show on hands-on photography was NFTs. I'll walk you through how to create one of those things. And yeah, it's it's easy, but not so easy. It's quite lucrative, but quite expensive all in one shot. So yeah, check it out. Twit.tv slash hop. Fantastic. Thank you, man. Sounds like the enterprise, uh, you know, it's simple, but not easy. So we need those easy buttons. <laughs> well, until next time, I'm Lewis Moresco, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. If you find yourself talking to those virtual assistants in your house quite often, or maybe you can make your light turn on and off with the touch of a button, well, Smart Tech Today is the show for you. Join Matthew Casanelli and myself, Micah Sargent, every week as we talk all about smart stuff and the fun that comes along with it. 